So I'm excited for you all to be here today and um, to talk about humanizing. So welcome, thank you for being here. And I'd like to just briefly go around and hear your names, discipline, favorite thing about teaching face-to-face -face, and favorite thing about teaching online. Well, I'll go first. Yeah. Thank you, Amber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Amber Durfield. I teach English and some uh, journalism comm stuff here and there. Um, favorite thing about teaching face-to-face, -face, well, is probably the, the opposite of, so my favorite thing about teaching face-to-face -face is the thing I can't have online, which is like the in-person, the energy in the room, um, just being present, like literally present with other people. Um, I think my favorite thing about teaching online is uh, not really sure. Maybe I'll get back to you <laughs> later on okay. that because I don't, I mean, I don't hate it, but it's just, it's not my preference. And I would just, I'm really looking forward to eventually being back in the classroom. Yeah. Someday. So you, someday. <laughs> you miss that human interaction, it sounds like, which I think we can all, yes. <laughs> we all feel that way. Yeah. yeah. How about right. you, Raquel? Thank you, Amber. So my name is Raquel Gutierrez. I am a counselor. So we te I teach counseling classes. More specifically, I teach the STEM uh, component to the counseling class we created for the CAP. And my favorite thing about teaching face-to-face -face is the same thing Amber said, just that I'm very, um, I'm an introvert, but I know you can't tell, but in class, I become an extrovert and I, you know, I'm very animated when I talk and it's challenging when I'm online because I am this animated, but it's only boxes because I, you know, I don't require them to put on their camera and all that. And so it's just kind of like, I'm just having a party by myself. <laughs> and so uh it's a little awkward there sometimes so uh so that's kind of what I liked about it. and you can kind of gauge it if you like if you lost the class you know like is everybody following or are you falling asleep on me maybe we should change it up let's have a break uh online I don't know what's happening uh and then uh favorite thing about teaching online I think it does give now this is just kind of like an observation not necessarily in my class I have observed that the more introverted students uh kind of may have a better ability to participate just because it's not in class if you will so they have other ways to participate so it does cater to that kind of personality type and just the accessibility we have a lot of students I know some students are struggling but others are thriving because they're like I can take all these classes and I'm working and it's all working out so I think I, I see that component of it, uh, which is nothing related to this, but just wanted to share that, that there are some positives to it, but I do miss that, um, that engagement that we yes. Really have. Yes, I can totally relate to the missing that, the feedback you get from students. You have to kind of imagine <laughs> the feedback when you're, when you're on Zoom, you don't get that interaction. Yes, I, I totally know what you're talking about. Thank you, Raquel. How about you, Patty? I'm Patty Glover, and I teach in cosmetology. Um, and I, I don't teach the fun part of cosmetology. I teach the science part, the skin and nails and chemistry and diseases, disorders, all that part. All the students want to take hair color cutting and design. So <laughs> my favorite thing about teaching face-to-face -face is the interaction. And I, too, like Raquel, I'm an introvert. But when I'm working, I have to be an extrovert because of what I teach. And I've missed uh, getting to know this, knowing the students by, you know, when we had to do earlier this, this semester, we had to do the student award. And we, it's like, who's that? Because we don't get to see them. At least when we're in session, we get to see them in the hallway. We get to, to know them and they get to know us a little bit. So that's what I miss. And, and of course, the teaching online does help the introverted students because they can chat instead of talk. They can, um, and I, their, all their assignments are done online, all their quizzes and, and anything they have to do. I, though, keep one, one or two um, projects that they have to communicate 
They have to do a nail art project. They have to tell what their thinking was behind it. And that's gone really well. It was Zoom, when they said, you're gonna be teaching on Zoom, I was like, what? What's that? And because I had no idea. And I've taken classes at At One, and I find for me, because of what I teach, they don't have the cap they don't, they cater to academia. They don't ha understand the CTE leg of it. Mm -hmm. And and I take, I so I was just like, okay, I want to take the classes there. I'm going to take one in the summer, but they don't, they, everything is for academia. The favorite part is, like I said, the students can um, use the chat to communicate. And I hate the, the blank spaces though. The, 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 when they turn off their cameras, it drives me insane. <laughs> but I have, they, you know, I can't make them keep it on while I'm lecturing. But when I'm demonstrating things and I want to make sure that they're getting what I'm saying, I have them turn it on so I can go down and look at it, look at them. And that, that's the hard part about teaching a, a CTE class online. Yes, and I'm so glad we have your perspective as well, because I think that you're you're bringing up a, a different point of view that maybe I wouldn't have thought about before in the CTE area. And all of you really, we're coming from totally different disciplines. So this is great. We, we can add all of those expertise and knowledge and wisdom into our discussion. Sarah, how about you at the library? Is there anything that you miss face to face and then things that you like about being online? Yeah, um, Sarah Bosler, uh, librarian, and, and our teaching situation is kind of unique just because it's not like in a traditional setting, but we, we do miss, you know, I miss uh, teaching face to face because a lot of what everyone else has said in terms of the energy and, and especially with body language and that kind of thing, but I think that one thing that's that I miss is the community element that you get with the, the, the people that you accidentally have a conversation with and students that accidentally, you know, get connected up with someone else just because of they overhear something that they're talking about in the library or, you know, in a classroom. <clears throat> so just kind of that community aspect of it, I really miss. And then also one of my favorite things is um, a lot of what other people have said too about the, the asynchronous aspect where people can take classes and work and have, you know, run, you know, organize their family and do some other tasks and kind of get that done in a way that they would have never have before. So I think that I've, I've heard a lot of students that appreciate that. Um, and also just uh, the ability for with the asynchronous and also just with different formats where students have a chance to to think a little bit more about their responses. They don't always have to respond right in the in the heat of the moment on the fly, because I think especially introverted students, you know, do do well with a little bit of space and time to think before they respond. So that's one thing that I've enjoyed. Yes, great. Thank you, Sarah. Patty, did you want to say something? I have a question. Do all of you teach asynchronously? No, I teach synchronous as well. I think Amber I do both. too. Mm -hmm, both. I do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do both. Because all of our classes are synchronous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because of the, the demonstration element of it. Yes. Uh -huh. uh huh. So we do it all synchronous. I do all of mine synchronously. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Um, well, thank you for, for your input and for answering the questions. And um, I feel the same way. I miss that connection and the energy, like Raquel was saying, of just being in the classroom. But the thing that I, I was thinking about this question for myself, what I love about being online that's kind of different that we wouldn't get on campus is I've gotten to meet newly born babies, kids, families, pets. <laughs> so that's really cool. I kind of feel like I've gotten a glimpse of my students' lives in a way that I never really did before. So that's definitely an added bonus to teaching online. Yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and continue. I'm excited to lead our discussion today. We're gonna talk about what humanizing is. I know you probably already have a pretty good idea, but we'll kind of get into explaining it, giving examples, why it's important, how we're already humanizing our courses. I've already heard some examples when Patty was talking about how she likes to partner up her students um, when they're learning, what was it, the nail 
um, learning how to do the nails. That's an exact example of humanizing. So we'll explore that more. How are we already doing it? And how can we grow what we're already doing that's working? We'll learn from each other and each other's experiences. And then ultimately, how might we enhance humanization in our classes? So I had mentioned I took the At One course, and it was four weeks long, 10 hours a week, so about 40 hours total. Learned a lot of great information, but there were times when it was kind of overwhelming, and I felt like, how am I going to apply all of this? And then I had to remind myself, wait, I don't have to apply all this. I can just take and pick what works for me. And so that same goes for you all today. Um, I, I've looked at all of the information and kind of analyzed it and thought carefully about what are the most useful tools that I can offer to you. And I'm gonna have links to different resources. So if there's something you wanna learn more about, if you feel like something in particular will work for you in your classes, then you can explore and find more information. And like I said, I'm gonna email you all the slides after we're done. So this is part one of a two-part workshop series Today will be myself, and then um, on May 27th will be Dr. Senya Lubisic. She'll be, be talking about um, technological tools that we can use. So um, when we explain humanizing, a lot of, there's a lot of really cool technology available, and so she'll she'll bring that aspect forward for us. And I just let's see, yeah. So what comes to mind when you see this picture? Well, I'm going to be real. I wish I had my students and they opened up the thing <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, I like, wow, they have their cameras on. I know. I'm like, that doesn't happen for me. Um, but um, yeah, just, just, I, there is that barrier, though. Yeah, so you see the barrier. So it's kind of like the, the screen and then the instructor or the student and it's yeah like kind of a wall that would zombie, be there if we were zombie <laughs> zombie <laughs> ultimately i mean yeah we would love to get our students to turn turn the cameras on absolutely that helps us to connect more with them um i think you know when i saw this it, it kind of made me a little sad like it made me think of being isolated and it made me think about this year and how much we have been isolated and and how hard that's been on all of us we're you know human beings need to connect we need to have communication interaction and I talk about this a lot in my interpersonal class and our immune systems are actually affected when we don't have enough enough human connection we get depressed we get sad you know it starts to impact us in in different ways both physically and emotionally and so we need human connection that is the core of what we are as human beings and we found that with online it can be tough. It's harder to create that human connection. So hopefully today with the tools that we're going to talk about, we'll be able to create more of that connection. Of course, it's never going to be the same as face to face, but there are definitely some things that we can do and some little things that we can tweak to try to create more of that connection. So think about a time where you felt like you belonged. You're with your group. You felt comfortable. You felt like you were where you were supposed to be. Well, the first thing that came to mind is when I'm like with in our with the rest of the counselors when we're meeting together and like brainstorming like that's like my people so I'm like that's my jam and I'm happy there that's awesome thank you Raquel anyone else it makes me think of when I've gone to these like dance parties where there's all these early morning dance party people and we all are you know just feeling the energy of the room and all feeling positive and you know dancing together reminds me of that. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Sarah. I think about, you know, yes, at school and definitely being a part of different groups at Citrus, I, I feel like I belong. Um, and I was thinking when was a time where I really felt like I found my groove. And that was when I was at Cal State Fullerton getting my graduate degree. And I felt like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. I love what I'm studying. I've got some great friends. I've connected with some great professors. And I felt like I belonged, but I didn't always feel that way. The first semester, I was really struggling. You guys all know that imposter syndrome where you feel like you don't belong. Oh, I had that really bad the first couple months of graduate school. I just didn't know if I had what it took to make it through. I was working full time and trying to manage all kinds of things in my life. And so I, I struggled with that. But eventually I connected with professors, like I said, and I felt supported. And so I started to get that belonging feeling. And our students have that also. They struggle with whether or not they're supposed to be in school or whether or not they're supposed to be in a particular class or if they're you know, at the level of a particular class. And so we definitely want to address that because if we don't feel like we belong, we're not going to be our best. We're going to be you know, kind of fighting that, that barrier of trying to fit in. 
And so let's look at overall um, a definition of humanizing or an explanation that's offered from Michelle Pekansky Brock. And a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today will come from her and her work. She um, works with At One and she developed the, the humanizing online education course that I had mentioned before. And this research was from June 2020, so it's, it's somewhat recent. Um, humanized online teaching ensures the non-cognitive components of learning are addressed through instructor-student relationships and community allowing connection, empathy to drive engagement and rigor. So again, you know, we were a lot of us in that survival mode last year at this time, trying to get all of our content for our students, making sure they knew all the important information. And of course, that's important, but equally important, we've learned probably throughout the last year is trying to create that connection and finding a way to connect and relate the information to students, because that's how they learn. That's how they grow. That's how they retain. That's how it becomes meaningful for them. And so that's really the essence of humanizing. So to me, um, when reading through a lot of the research and the different things that have been um, created on helping us to humanize our courses, this is what I've come up with. It means enhancing the human connection of online education. That's the ultimate goal. Creating community, expressing empathy, communicating that you care, feeling seen and valued, interpersonal communication that fosters a student-teacher partnership or even relationship and student-to-student, -student, I would add that as well. Is there anything that any of you would add to the list? Things that would add to or, or make a community in the classroom connection, humanization? Laughing. Ah, having fun, yeah, enjoying. I love that, Sarah. Being in the moment. Yes, yes, I love that. <laughs> I think too, for me, sometimes it, it um, like allowing ourselves to go down the little rabbit trails, you know, like, uh, for example, the other day in my Com 100 class, we were talking about the movie industry. And so I was going through the stuff and somebody started talking about, oh yeah, I saw this one movie the other day. And so we talked about our favorite movies for like 10 minutes. And I thought, well, this doesn't really, re I mean, it's kind of related to the stuff we're supposed to be talking about, but, but on the other hand, it was the first time all semester that the students really like their eyes brightened and they sort of came alive and they were laughing and sharing ideas and recommending movies. And, and I thought, okay, this is, you know, I felt like we were connecting. So for me, I guess it's allowing, cause I can be pretty rigid. Like I have this agenda and I have all these things I want to say but just allowing ourselves to be free sometimes, um, I think could, could really help to humanize things. Yes, absolutely, Amber. And it doesn't always have to be embedded in the course. I mean, you could sometimes find a way <laughs> to tie it in, but yeah, that fun, that connection, that bonding is, is really important. Thank you so, so much for sharing that example. That was great. Any other thoughts or things you'd want to add? Well, I would echo what Amber's saying too, because I think one, so I get, I get like that too. Like I really have a plan and this is what it's going to be. Oh, yeah. And then, and then things start happening that I didn't plan for. And I have to sometimes realize this is where the connection and the, in the learning. And even if it's not, even if it's off topic, the connection and the community is being built and that will be a, a safe and productive space for content later, you know, like, and I think that when they walk out of a class, like it's the, it's the relationships that they remember and the connections not always the content, sorry to, sorry to break that to everybody, but the, the heart stuff, you know? You can bring the content to a deeper level when people are feeling safe and comfortable and, and in a good learning space. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so the humanizing is oftentimes referred to as a special sauce uh, because it's kind of like that secret ingredient in teaching that enhances the connection and helps students to thrive. And there are two, key ingredients to this secret sauce. And this comes from Pekansky Brock and the, the course, that one course. First is you, the, the instructor. I remember when I was in graduate school and even undergrad, I would sometimes arrange my whole schedule around one professor that I knew I had to take. And you know, you're all nodding your heads because you, you probably did that as well. And we hear our students do that too. They want to see you. They want to see your presence in the class, not just get the content, but they want to hear your stories. They want to hear your experience. They want to hear your explanations. And so you are really ultimately what makes that content come alive for your students. They may not tell us that. <laughs> 
<laughs> but they do. I mean, think about our own experiences. Um, and the presence can be conveyed through welcome videos, weekly announcements, personalized feedback, participation in online discussion boards, and being engaged and supportive. And we're going to give you a lot more. We'll add to this, and I'll give you some examples of this a little bit later. And then the second ingredient is social presence. And this is basically, if we do this right, we create a sense of community to where you feel like you're a part of a group, you feel like you belong. It's the sense that you're interacting with real people. So not just a computer screen and content, it adds to the human dimension and makes learning more meaningful and improves student to student interactions, it enhances their ability to learn and even their satisfaction with the course. So it's not just teacher student interaction and communication, it's also student student communication and interaction that's just as important, especially now we, we're trying to find ways where we can create those interactions since we're kind of lacking being online. So I've got a little clip here. This comes from the At One course to show what it looks like. And this is Pekansky Brock's class. She's interviewing a couple of students. What was done in the class to help foster community? Can you think of any specific examples? Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you beyond what you've already shared? Well, I think um, one, one of the things that was definitely collaborative in, um, in our class was the fact that we were encouraged or assigned um, specific times where we were the presenter. And um, and not not only just focusing on each other's um, comments and things like that, but being responsible for um, bringing work to the table that might not otherwise have been there if we weren't involved personally, right? It was a real intimate experience where we were responsible for a portion of the class. Mm -hmm. And if, and if you're not taking that seriously, you, you have that anonymity and nobody knows whether you maybe did your work or you didn't, then you might not put as much effort into yeah. it and you definitely wouldn't have been, uh, I definitely wouldn't have felt as connected um, to the class and to the individuals within the class and to you as an instructor without that experience. Yeah. You know, another thing that, that I know when you had talked about, you know, how we became a community in this class, um, that very first assignment, you, you our, our favorite photo, you had everyone upload a photo that was favorite to them and, that, and explain, you know, what it was and share it. And that really started that community environment with this class, kind of listening to everyone's stories, seeing their photographs of their family, um, seeing Cindy's cute little boy with the drinking fountain that I'll never forget. I love that little kid <laughs> now that he's 17. Um, but, you know, um, pictures with grandparents and pictures with, you know, younger kids and the grandparents aren't here anymore and how special that photo and what it means to them. That really was a wonderful start to our class. And then, then you followed it up with, you know, what is, you know, photo, photo, photographs that change the world and, and having us comment on those, those, you know, tear jerking photos that we, you know, basically all of us were probably just crying, <laughs> you know, talking about, you know, how those affected us. And, and, you know, that was just a really great start to the class to get us really engaged. So it sounds like a fun class, doesn't it? <laughs> those pictures are really cool. That's a great idea. I never thought of doing an icebreaker where they bring pictures. Does anyone have a way that they create a sense of community in their classes? Something that's worked to create that connection? Hi, Senya. I'm here. <laughs> Welcome. I, I always think icebreakers are important um, just because it creates a little bit of space before you start into the content. Um, it's sort of the, the welcome mat. Um, and I love the photos and the video. Um, for my classes, I have them share links to hobbies and so it's a nice way for students to sort of connect with people and say, ah, I like to hike there too. Or, you know, they sort of find those, those points of, of commonality. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Sonia. With this Hi. class for my icebreaker, I did a, a discussion board. I'd never done one before. So I used Sonia's example from when we took the class and they, I put up a discussion and I used the same icebreaker I always use you know, why are you, why did you decide to become a cosmetologist? 
make your, spell your name out in positive words. Like, you know, if your name's Connie, creative. And um, what is your, oh, your favorite, what is your favorite thing in this, in this industry? And it was, everybody responded. Some of them didn't do the re reply to two other people. So, um, but I'd never done that before. And I thought that was really, I was, I was proud of myself. Yeah, that that's great. A discussion board. Yeah, those were great questions. I love the name, the, spelling out your name in positive, positive ways. That's really cool. And you get a sense of them in that as well. You Any other? A lot from elementary. Oh, you did. <laughs> that's um, great. You know, I got this. One of my, our supervisors used to tell me, could you stop going to the teacher store? These are college kids and they, there's so many interesting things there. And I found that there, I believe. Yeah, and it's, it's back to that fun element. We need to bring fun into our experience with our students. We all need more fun, I think. <laughs> yeah, so now that we know what humanizing is, you're kind of getting probably lots of ideas of how you're doing this in your classes, and maybe even you're getting ideas of how you can do it more. Let's look at why it's important. So there's a lady by the name of Valerie Pennington, and she is called the Penguin Prof. Has anybody come across her videos? She has a lot of really fun, she's a professor of biology, um, a lot of fun short little videos on YouTube, how to set up Zoom, tricks for Zoom, lighting. Um, she also adds a lot of biology information in there, uh, other videos with biology. So um, she's really fun to watch, very anima animated and dynamic. And one video that I came across that she just posted last month that was on the at one site and it was talking about our brains and how when we go through the way that we learn and how um, our brains are influenced by when we're comfortable when we're feeling comfortable and safe versus when we're experiencing fear and anxiety. And she talks about how we're, we're really we don't want our students to be super comfortable because then they're not motivated they're so relaxed that they're not really kind of tuned in and sharp and awake and alert, but we also don't want them to be be in the fear zone because then they're kind of in that panic and they're not able to feel safe enough to relax and, and absorb information. So she says the sweet spot is kind of in, in the middle where those two overlap. And that's what we want to create for our students. So we want to have that balance of it being challenging and stimulating, but we also want to create safety and trust within our class. And so she gives some examples and suggestions for this, which I'll get to a little bit later, but I've got a link here, which you guys will get with the slides. Um, it's about 13 minutes definitely worth watching. It was a fun, fun video. She, if you just type her name up, you'll get all kinds of links to her on YouTube. Also, we have research, a great deal of research, and this is highlighted in the At One course on the highlight between or linking the, the importance of a caring instructor and in student success. So the Community College Research Center at Teachers College, Columbia University, completed a series of studies, and you can look at the studies through that link later, um, that examined high demand entry level online courses at two community colleges. And they found that the students stressed the value of interacting with instructors. And the study found that higher levels of interpersonal interaction were correlated with higher grades in online courses. And when students sensed a lack of caring from their online instructors, they reported feeling isolated and like they had to teach themselves. Another study, they were looking at um, learning objectives, effectiveness of technology integration and depth of interpersonal interaction. The biggest predictor of, it, if, of the grades in the course was interpersonal interaction and students in low interaction courses earned nearly one grade lower. So back to that, we started off talking about um, the, the content is important, yes, but that connection is equally important, how we're connecting with our students, they want to connect with us. And then other research on men of color and first generation students in community college has emphasized that relationship before pedagogy is a tenant of effective teaching. And we probably all know this kind of instinctually, we know how important it is to connect with our students in the classroom, but it's a little more difficult online. And so that equity gap gets exacerbated. So the humanizing, intentionally cultivating welcomeness to engage through trust and mutual respect and authentic care helps to reduce those equity gaps that are present, even more present in online learning. 
So what about Citrus College? What about our students? Where do they fall in all of this? Um, in the At One course, one of the assignments that they have you do toward the end of the four weeks is interview a student who has been taking online classes, which was easy because <laughs> all of our students were taking online classes, um, and ask them about their experience. And so they had a few questions, I think five questions, and I narrowed it down to three. And um, well, later after doing that exercise, I decided I wanted to know more. I got some good input from the student that are interviewed and I had watched the videos of other people interviewing their students um, but I thought oh I wonder what the rest of my students have to say about this so I posted some questions it was voluntary it was I told them I might share it with my colleagues later because <laughs> I kind of had this workshop in mind and uh, very informal but the results were interesting so I'll share some of them with you and I ended up getting 49 responses this is over winter session my speech 100 and speech 101 class and I, I'm not going to share all of them with you, but um, these are kind of indicative of the responses that I got. I've loved being able to come back to school completely online and be able to be home with my kids. So the question was, would you describe your online learning experience as positive, neutral, or negative? And I hear this a lot, um, students with kids or family members, people they have to take care of. They really enjoy being online and the freedom that gives them. I'm fortunate to say that my online experiences at Citrus have been wonderful, yay. It's been a positive experience for me because I become very overwhelmed and get anxiety when surrounded by others or by when being put on the spot. Online classes have given me the confidence to continue with my education. That taps into what we were saying, online um, education gives students that maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to go to school. Um, it, it allows them to go. And I hear this a lot from my public speaking students. They're terrified of giving speeches, of course. They come in with a lot of anxiety. And uh, some of them have mentioned, you know, I wasn't going to take this class, but now that it's online, I feel a little bit safer with being able to record my speeches and not have to stand up in front of a whole group of people. So it, I find this to be true for a lot of students. Now this last student, I personally hate every second of it. The fact that I can't ask a question right then and there is very difficult for me. So this student is definitely feeling isolated, disconnected, um, frustrated with not being able to connect with the professor. Um, luckily, a majority of the responses were positive, but we have to keep in mind there, there are definitely opportunities and ways where we can connect with students. So then the next question was, um, how have your prof professors helped you make success with online learning? They responded to my emails quickly, <laughs> so the emails are important. My professors also had videos on how to navigate through the course modules. Professors motiv motivated me to keep going even when I wanted to quit. My professors have been amazing. It has made online learning a lot easier with their help. Every professor I've had thus far has been amazing and gone the extra mile to ensure that their students are successful with online courses. So you can see we definitely have an impact on students and we're doing a lot of this well in creating um, this connection and helping them to feel supported. And back to what we were talking about with instructor presence, that is the key to facilitating um, success for our students. Last question, this was my favorite. If there was one piece of advice you could give to your next online instructors, what would it be? To get students to interact with each other. <laughs> That's one of the first things we talked about, Patty, with her exercise. And uh, students want to have communication with each other and community with each other. And so I, I keep that in mind. Actually, my, my courses over spring, I was thinking, OK, how can I get them to work together more? Keep encouraging us because we want to do well. So those little words of encouragement and support go a long way. It's more important when you see your actual, or more helpful when you see your actual professor explaining the material rather than a YouTube video. They want to see us, even if it's imperfect. I've heard that um, as well. Students really appreciate it when we are given opportunities to redeem ourselves. So giving them second chances can make all the difference for some students. To be very organized, whether it's with directions or a detailed syllabus, I always like it when professors have a schedule for the whole course ready on day one. Please record in audio or video along with your slides. They really help to understand the topic and it humanizes you. <laughs> they, want that. they want that connection. Have compassion and empathy. We can see online when you care for us, that results in us caring for you and your class even more than what we already do. We care about our grades, yes, but we also care for you. So that just sums, sums it all up. The point of humanizing and the importance of it. So I know we've already kind of talked a bit about your experiences and, and what's worked for you and ways you've built a sense of community, but has anything come up 
that we haven't mentioned, things that have worked for you? We talked a little bit about icebreakers. I think the, the comment about getting emails um, right away is an important one, and it's not always possible. Um, I've not used anything like Discord or Slack with my classes, um, but I know that that's a tool that allows students to have a lot of back-channel communication um, and to get help. Um, in classes that I've seen, some faculty have the chat function open in Canvas which allows students to have a running chat inside the course. Um, and those are sometimes a little bit easier for students to access or to use than a, a Q&A discussion board um, that's built inside the course. But um, I think that's just one way that we can support that wanting to connect and, and needing answers at the same time. Yes, that's a great idea. I never thought to, to about the chat for that purpose. Um, I, I've done the discussion board with the Q&A, but it, it seems like it's not used very often. So I think the chat is, is a great suggestion. Yeah, thank you, Senya. Any other ways that you've created connection? Well, on the library website, even though we don't have a, a traditional class, we um, we have two librarians, myself and Elizabeth Cook, who are always on chat. So we always have it logged in and students can text or chat with us during our business hours. So you know, I'm, I'm awaiting chats as we as we are here right now. So that I think that the live element of that of like when people have a question that they can kind of quickly ask or that they could see that their teacher is online. I didn't know that Canvas had that chat feature. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes just something, you know, quick and on the fly type of thing is easy like that. And, and our chat feature, if we're not available online, it goes to a, a little space where we can see it and pick it up the next time we log in. So I let people know when I'm teaching the classes that if you send a chat and we're toasting a bagel and we missed it or whatever, <laughs> you know, that we'll come back and, and, and pick it up afterwards. But I think that kind of live element of communication is, is helpful, I've found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keeping that that connection. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, good. All right. So now we know what humanizing is. We know what it looks like. We know why it's important. So let's look at some tools and some ways, ideas for how we can um, enhance the humanization in our classes. So this comes from Pekansky Brock's uh, website. She talks about four interwoven principles to enhance humanization in our classes. And the first is trust. So we want to cultivate trust in our online community with our students and member Valerie Pennington, the penguin prof that I was talking about earlier. She talks about in order to establish trust, we need to build consistency, uh, maybe having certain assignments due. Like I always have my quizzes due on Sunday, so they know no matter what, they're going to have a quiz due on Sunday, uh, letting them know the plans in the future, um, helping them clearly to understand expectations, using encouraging language, follow through. If you say you're going to send something, do your best to do that because students are looking for that, that follow through as well. Um, they also mentioned, and this is encouraged throughout the at one course as well, is um, posting videos, short little imperfect videos that share aspects of our lives so our students can get to know us. And that kind of unknown uncertainty, fear, anxiety uh, dissipates a bit as we get more information and learn more about each other recording the videos while cooking, while walking your dog. One of the instructors in the At One course had a video. It was fun. She was at Disneyland <laughs> back before the pandemic. So that was just kind of a unique, creative idea, way to connect with students. And then presence, we talked about uh, the importance of social presence, creating that sense of, of community and just being there in your class. I work really hard, especially in the beginning, the first week or so, to be really actively engaged with my students if they're posting things online in the discussion boards, I'll make sure I'm showing, hey, look, I'm seeing them and I'm responding and I'm showing that I'm interested in what they're sharing. Um, and I do that throughout the course, but I really do it heavily in the beginning just so they can see and feel my presence. Awareness, knowing your students, getting to know them, being aware of what their needs are, what their struggles are. We'll talk about some ways we can do that a little bit later. And empathy, slowing down, seeing things through your students' eyes, asking questions, ask how they're doing. I'm always um, so impressed by all when I take time to talk to my students and hear about their lives. And I'm always so impressed by all the things that they're doing and managing and the different challenges they're overcoming, yet they're still showing up for class and still you know, completing assignments on time. So that empathy and just learning about them, I think can go a long ways. So um, McCansky Brock talks about high opportunity zones and the first week 
actually the, the week before class starts, anxiety is starting to get high for students before, you know, they're wondering how they're going to do in their classes and maybe they're not quite sure. Um, and then as we go into the first week, that anxiety is still high. So if we can send out, and you, you all learned this in the first at one course that, hello, welcome to the class, the welcome letter in the beginning, just getting that connection with you, maybe even a video helps to reduce some of that anxiety for students. And I, this little kitty reminds me of my public speaking students. <laughs> the first week they're like half in, half out, one foot in, one foot out the door. <laughs> and so I try to, oh, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. You know, I try to spend some time letting them get to know each other and also letting to get letting them get to know me and those first two weeks are really important and there's another at one course called 10 10 10 that does a really good job it's um the first 10 minutes 10 hours and 10 days and so it helps you to create a warm welcoming environment for your students in that really crucial time where you know they're deciding whether they're all in or or they're not so that's another good class to kind of keep in mind for that so let's talk about uh, when is the time you felt supported? Can you think of a time where you felt like, okay, I'm not alone in this? And what are things that cause you to feel supported? I would say when I hear that other people are struggling with the same thing that I'm struggling with, I, I feel supported. Even if I don't have a solution, I at least feel like I have people in the same boat with me, you know? Mm -hmm. So a, ch a chance to, sh to share and it, like listening and speaking is part of that for me, I realize when you ask that question, so. Yeah, so if just having that connection, maybe the problem isn't solved, but at least you mm -hmm. have someone that you can share that, that feeling with or that experience with. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Any other? I'm not good at asking for help, but I've had some really wonderful mentors mm -hmm. who give me these great nudges. Um, I haven't asked for help, but they'll just send me something and say, I you know, saw this and was thinking of you. And if it's helpful, great. And if it's not, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've taken that approach with some of my students when they get kind of quiet. Um, I'll maybe send an article if I know that they're working on a particular topic and say, hey, I came across this. And uh, you, if it's helpful to you, fantastic. And if not, ignore it. But you were, on, you were in my thoughts. And mm -hmm. I think it's just that sort of being seen without having to, to ask to be seen that sometimes feels really good. Yes, your presence being acknowledged. Yeah, I see you. That's that's great. Thank you, Sonia. Any other ways that you feel supported? I think it's almost what Sarah said, though, because I do have my go-to buddy. So when I got thrown into going online, I was like, oh my God, how do I do this? And then so just having someone who had already done it and be like, and then just like pick their brain and then they'll give you their tools. And like, this is how I do it, but you know, do your own. So just knowing that I could go bug someone and then they're like, it's okay. And then eventually I will do that for someone else. Kind of, I really believe in paying it forward. So I bug yeah. my friend, but I will do that for someone else when the time comes, when I'm at that level. <laughs> yeah. So just kind of the give and take and just having someone be there for you when you're struggling to, to give a helping hand. Yeah. Thank you, Raquel. So that's in essence what humanizing is and um, we're going to focus on some tools some ways that we can cultivate it in our classes so Pekansky Brock on her website this is also coming from her website introduces eight elements that are offered as starting points for cultivating and enhancing humanizing in our online courses and remember I said at the beginning there's a lot of information and tools out there you don't have to do them all <laughs> um, to, to feel like you're humanizing your course you can just pick one you can adapt it you can make it work for you so it just you know these are just kind of ideas and you can run with them so the first tool she offers or element is a liquid syllabus have any of you heard of this before you know sarah and senya probably have so they they use this in, in a lot of the at one courses now and the idea is to create a syllabus that's easy for your students to access so um to put it onto like a google.com a website so that they can click and open and look explore it's interactive you can have videos and links without having to log into canvas um, I haven't done that. I haven't gotten to that point yet, but even just putting my syllabus into a page on Canvas has helped because it's more interactive than them just opening the document and I can put links to modules and things in that syllabus and add videos and images. So it's a lot more dynamic than just 
you know, are typical giving them the Word doc or PDF. So I'm going to show you this little clip. This will kind of give you a, a sense of, of what they mean by liquid syllabus. I know what you're thinking. I have a syllabus. I've worked really hard on it. So why should I take the time to also create a liquid syllabus? And what does that mean anyway? After all, I already have my syllabus online in the form of a PDF. And I know all my students can access it in Canvas. But folks, the thing is, when your syllabus is behind a login screen, it may be tough for students to get to it from their phone. And no matter how lovely it looks on a computer, reading it on a mobile device is tough. The information in that syllabus is important, right? The bottom line is when we use tools designed for print products, they don't result in mobile friendly experiences. And that's not good for our students. How might things change if you used a website tool like Google Sites or WordPress to create a liquid version of your syllabus? For just a moment, imagine being a student it's the start of your first semester in college and the week before class starts. You check your email and you get a friendly welcome message from your sociology instructor. It includes a button at the bottom to check the syllabus. You tap that button with your finger and instantly you go to a syllabus that's easy to read and experience with the swipe of your finger. And you also discover something pretty special at the top. Hi scholars, my name is Katie Whitman Conklin and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. A little bit about me, I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years with my husband and children while he was stationed there with the Navy. And when he retired, we moved to Northern Idaho where we now live with our kids on a family ranch. You think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna love this class. I can't wait to get started. But you know what? That's not the only benefit of a liquid syllabus. Since it lives on the web, it's shareable with a simple link. That means you can place that link in as many other places as you'd like. How about adding it next to your course description in your college's class schedule? Or on your profile page on your college website? Or a link on your own professional website? And you know what can really help promote your course and encourage more students to enroll? That's right share it on Twitter. When we design with web tools, we create mobile friendly content that supports our students in so many ways. It also lets them know we care. I know what Okay, so um, there's a link here if you're if that's something you're interested in learning how to do there's an at one self paced free class and you can click there and it'll she'll walk you through step by step. How to create a liquid syllabus if that's something that you feel would help enhance your class. Number two. I have a question is, really quick. Oh yeah, Sarah, you go ahead. That one. Sure. Do we have the ability in our canvas or not in our canvas, but in our, thinking. in our swing span schedule to have a link to a, a section syllabus? Yeah. Um, I do it every semester. So you can have your own long text added to your class. So I always let students know that I'm going to send a welcome letter that they have a check-in that's due by a certain date. And when I made a liquid syllabus, I added the link there. So you just have to work with your division um, uh, administrative assistant to help get that text in. Um, and then it can roll over semester to semester. Very cool. And then you update it. So it's uh, it's on a website that you've you've mm -hmm. updated. Yeah, that's great. Thanks oh, the so link much. stays the same. And then you just update. You don't have to update the link each time. Oh, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I don't. So does that show up when students are searching for a class, like in that, in the class schedule? Yeah, it should. So when they pull up, if they pull up my class, there should be long text that has that information. Okay. I was looking at it right now just to see what it looks like, but maybe it's not in there yet for fall. Maybe not. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Yeah, good. it's an option. It's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> Okay, so the next suggestion is the homepage and humanizing our homepage. So making it interactive and welcoming to students right when they come in. And I kind of think of it like we were saying before, the welcome mat 
uh, you know, you're having people over for dinner, they come to the door, you want to welcome them, help them to feel comfortable. You're not going to bombard them with, okay, we're going to have lasagna and then we're going to have dessert and then we're going to play a game. And they're like, ah, I don't know if I want to stay. I'm a little stressed out. <laughs> so the same thing goes for your homepage. And I've had to take my own advice because I wanted to give them all this important information, but they can feel a bit bombarded. You've got all of that information in your syllabus. So the homepage should really just be a way to welcome them to the class help them to feel comfortable. Um, and here's a, a clip to kind of give us a sense of this. I wanted to share my humanized homepage for Math 1A. In doing this redesign, I had a few goals. One goal is that um, the students know that I'm here to support their success and I believe in their success. And so I've included this brief one minute welcome video of myself in a casual setting. I just tell them a little bit about my point of view on the class and give them a couple tips for getting off to a strong start. Another goal of this page was um, that strong start, in addition to having a feeling of support and encouragement, I wanted them to have the information that they really need right here in front of their eyes the first thing they open the course. And so I've listed out um, the due dates that they need to be aware of for that first week so that they don't feel behind before they even start. Um, and then the other goal I had for this page is that the navigation be very simple, no question about what the students should do. So I've numbered these three steps and the third step, start learning, is the only one that's a clickable button and that takes the students straight into the first module of the course, which is an orientation module. So that kind of gives you a sense of, of the homepage. And the, again, the 10, 10, 10 course I was mentioning earlier, they focus a lot on the, the homepage as well. And um, the at one course offers some suggestions for that. Or if you go to Pekansky Brock's website, she also gives some examples of, of what the homepage, different ideas for what the homepage could look like. So the number three is the get to know you survey. And this kind of connects to that getting to know our students, empathizing with our students, finding out what are, what are things that they're worried about, what are barriers that they think might get in the way of them doing well. And this can take place early on in the semester. So asking in the very beginning, what kind of feedback they prefer, if you like to offer video feedback or written feedback, what are your concerns about the class, name one thing that might interfere with your success in the class, and on a scale of one to five, this is for me, how much anxiety do you have when you think about presenting a speech? And so I can see the students who are really have high levels of anxiety and kind of reach out to them and, you know, encourage them not to drop the class. <laughs> Because that first week, I find that's when they're kind of, uh, um, it could be, you know, how much anxiety do you have with writing a paper or conducting research or whatever your class is focused on. And then what are your major and career goals? And I love to, in the beginning, learn as much as I can about them because it helps me to really tailor, tailor the course specifically to the group of students that I have. So if I have a class where I have a lot of nursing students, I can try to bring in some examples from nursing or ideas, topics that might be interesting for students who are studying nursing or wanting to go into, into that field. So this is a great way to kind of take the temperature with your students and then you can use it throughout the course of the semester. And um, Pekansky Brock suggests using a, a form. You can use a Google form to do this. Yeah, I really like that idea of having a form. I saw that when I took the humanizing class. I, I thought that was really helpful just to you just get to know them a little bit better, you know. Mm -hmm. You all use the notes tab in the gradebook where you can put little notes to yourself um, from students. I just discovered that a couple months ago and it was helpful because it's, sometimes it's hard to keep track of all your students online and I'll get, you know, someone who's telling, I'm going to have a baby in a month and I don't want to forget that they're going to be gone for, you know, a week of class or two weeks or, or however long. And so the notes is great for those types of things. And even students who maybe need extra time for their tests, it's in the grade book on Canvas and you click um, view and then in the underneath view, there'll, there'll be a, a link to creating notes. And if anyone wants to show me to show you after this, I, I'll be happy to do that. But so you can give yourself notes and you can only you are seeing them and it shows up right next to the student's name in the grade book. Senya knows about that. <laughs> yeah.
And then um, the next is feedback. We all know how important our feedback is for our students' growth. That's one of my favorite things about being a, a teacher is seeing them grow throughout the semester and seeing them learn and take the, the things that we offer and, and kind of develop and um, strengthen their skills. But the way we give our feedback is really important. And coming from the perspective of communication, speech communication, we talk a lot about nonverbal communication. And there's been a ton of research on how strong or important or nonverbal communication is and researchers don't really agree as to how much some studies show 65% others 85% and even more than that of our the point part of our communication that comes from our nonverbals but what they do agree is that more than half so if you think about what we're communicating more than half of what we're communicating comes from our nonverbals and if it's a, an emotional message that we're communicating even more so so if you think about the feedback that you give your students if it's written there's a lot of room for misunderstanding and misinterpretation if they're a little insecure about the project that they submitted or that topic or if they've had a bad experience with with a class before um, that was in a similar area they might be hearing these kind of negative thoughts and interpreting your feedback much more negatively that, than it was meant to be whereas if you can um, use the voice tool or even better record a video it'll help to help them to communicate that you believe in them that they're, that you're supporting them and they'll hear the nonverbal element of what was meant in the feedback that you're providing for your students. And it can be a little more work. The audio tool, I think actually can save some time, but doing the videos can be a little more work. And it doesn't necessarily have to be every single time you post feedback, just doing it maybe in the beginning of the class, so they can get a sense of you and your style of grading. And if you're able to add your voice to the feedback, that, that helps a lot. Has anyone done that before already? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's worth trying, definitely. Yeah, I like I like doing that. I have a question really quick just about well not a question but your idea of of the voice feedback reminded me of um it, the this this tool that i recently learned about called name coach that we were i'm hoping maybe we can get it at citrus i think it will be really helpful because i think it creates that humanizing element where it allows all the students to record themselves saying their name and so they can see how to pronounce other students names and then the teacher can hear how to how a student pronounces their name so even though you might be in an online environment where you don't think you're going to be having a lot of audio and audio the audio role is really important and so i think that that's super helpful just in terms of of just you know just i see you you know like i i hear you and i and i hear how you say your voice and i can play it over and over again so i can you know try to learn it so i think that's helpful yeah definitely i love that that's a great idea and then voice thread is another tool mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it creates a lot of interaction uh, with students and it's nice to to be able to have that voice element yeah thanks sarah for sharing that i hope we can get access to that so then next icebreakers and i love icebreakers too <laughs> Sonia had talked about that earlier I, they make you know they lighten the the if it's a stressful you know first time we're all meeting each other they kind of lighten that up they help us to connect and relate we saw pakansky brock's example of the photograph you know coming up with questions i loved patty's their name and writing out the, the different letters of their name i have students in my interpersonal class um first couple weeks of, of the course, I have them bring an object to class and share how that object represents them. So kind of like a show and tell, and we we're talking about self-concept and how they see themselves. And they, I, I noticed, I used to do this later on in the semester, but I noticed such a difference in the class and the sense of community, just sharing that object created connections and, oh, wow, I like to do that too. Or, oh, you know, sometimes they'll bring their art. And it's like, oh, you know, we're all so impressed with their, their talent. And so I, I ended up doing it. I didn't do it right away. Way, but I started doing that same exercise even in the Zoom meetings. And so they're all bringing their, <laughs> their objects in their rooms and, and sharing it to us. And it's just a really nice way to break the ice. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of time and it creates that sense of, of community. So the next, which I love this idea, it's called a wisdom wall. And they did this in the at one course and it's through uh, Flipgrid is one, they use a lot of different apps. Um, and the other they use is Padlet. 
And so you post your responses and it's really cool because when you get to this point in the class, you can see all the people who've come before you and their responses and what they learned and, and how the class impacted them. And so it's a way for students to share, you know, this is what I've, I've learned. Here are some words of advice for students in the future. I think it's a nice way to kind of end the class and then also to start the class with the, the content. And you could do this, there are lots of cool tools you can use, but you could even do it just as a discussion board in Canvas or have students post videos, have one person post a video and then have another person post a video in response to the, the other student's video. So there's lots of different ways you can kind of formulate this wisdom wall or apply the idea. Number seven, they call them bumper videos. And these are two to three minute short little videos that we can sprinkle around our course. Remember we talked about instructor presence. This is a great way to have your presence be a part of the class without really spending a whole lot of time or putting in a lot of effort. Just, hey, you know, encouraging videos. Hey, you're all doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Or, you know, maybe a fun like the instructor that was at Disneyland or, hey, I'm cooking dinner. <laughs> was thinking about our discussion in class yesterday. And there's a really cool tool called Adobe Spark. Spark. Have any of you used Adobe Spark? That's a really fun way, very user friendly. You know, it walks you through the steps and it makes your video seem super professional because it adds music and it does the words and all kinds of graphics. And so you can just pretty much create a short little video out of anything and make it look really dynamic and engaging. I'm sure there's other um, screencast-o-matic is another one that's that I've heard about. I haven't used that one. So there's lots of different ways we can do that. And then last, micro lectures. So creating a series of five to 10 minute laser focused videos to guide your students through the comprehension of complex topics, concepts. And I've learned <laughs> with Zoom, I can't lecture the way I used to in class. I used to, you know, give a lecture for 25, 30 minutes. And I've noticed that when I post those longer lectures, students don't watch them. They'll watch maybe the first 10 minutes or so. And they don't seem, maybe I'll have a couple who will watch the whole thing, but not very many. But if I post a five to 10 minute video, I get a lot more students watching the video. So there's a way in Canvas where you can actually see, you know, how many people watched it and, and for how long. So the shorter videos, you can still have the same content, but just kind of breaking it up throughout the, the modules helps the students to kind of break down and absorb the information. The elements I wanted to share with you, I'd love to hear your ideas, thoughts, things that you've done that have worked, um, things that you would add to the list. Uh, how we can all learn from each other and continue to humanize our courses. I'm fresh out of looking at some online courses this morning and um, it's something I struggle with. I, I tend to opt for very formal language when I'm writing or communicating. And I'm always so impressed when I see um, instructors writing to their students and using really kind of fun terms. Um, the one that's been running around in my head was um, an instructor who was correcting a student's work and said, this is your fix it ticket. You know, like you've got this chance to come in and fix it and resubmit and we'll just forget that, that you had this broken taillight on your paper, you know, <laughs> it's, it's all good. But it was just this really digestible and easy way to communicate what you wanted the student in a way that didn't, to me, feel um, like you were being scolded. You know, it was really kind of a fun, like, oh yeah, I got a fix it ticket. Cool, I can do that. Um, and I, I, I need to do more of that in my own classes. Yeah, yeah, that taps into what we were talking about in the beginning is just having fun, you know, not taking it at all so serious <laughs> and just kind of lightening the mood when we can. And if we can say something in a, in a creative way or present something in a creative way, yeah, definitely let the conversation go off a little bit and talk about movies. <laughs> any other ideas, any, any good icebreakers that you'd like to share with us? Did somebody said that they had them post their favorite cat and dog video? I love that. It's always the rage on everything. And then she said that she was amazed how many people went back like during stressful times in the semester just to watch this whole gallery of cat and dog photos. And I thought, ah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that is a great idea. We all love pets and we love to share our pets <laughs> with each other. And yeah, that's a good way for the class to bond too. Because anytime you start to talk about pets, it, you know, it gets people to connect. Um, I just, I always like to start off the class just asking my students how they are and what they did last weekend, you know, especially with the pandemic, you know, things are always changing. So whatever is going on with the pandemic at a particular point in time, I'll just ask, you know, 
about that. And sometimes, I mean, the, sometimes the conversation gets really deep. Like one of my students had lost her brother over the weekend. And then another student shared that she had also um, lost her grandfather. And so we kind of had a, a talk about that. Like we, we totally veered off and just talked about loss and, and how we deal with loss. And I did not have that planned at all, but it ended up being, you know, a really meaningful discussion for everybody in a way to connect. And so I think I think just yeah, finding ways to connect with students and communicate that they care and you know, having to think about it differently than we did in the classroom, which is hard because you know, we spent years <laughs> developing our skill to teach in front of students in the classroom and now we're having to learn a new way. And I have so much respect uh, for you guys who have had to do it so quickly without having that past experience or even wanting to, <laughs> to teach online, you were kind of thrown into it. And I appreciate that you all we're here today and giving your input. It's so nice to see everyone and hear your ideas and your experiences. I do have some resources for you here and I'll email this to you today. So you have the links that at one course for humanizing, there's one offer July 12th and then another August 23rd if you want to take that. It's more of what we talked about today. And then the 1010 course that I had mentioned is also available July 12th and then August 16th. The classes are always really fun. I learned so much from them. Um, there's some free self-paced. I had mentioned the syllabus, liquid syllabus. There's the humanizing, humanizing challenge. So it's kind of like a lighter version of the class. How to create a video. If you're wanting to do more videos, that's a great way to add your presence and to create connection. I know students love to see us <laughs> in our videos. I hear that a lot. They, they like when instructors post videos. And um, some th other things we, you can get reimbursed for from FLY. And the deadline is June 14th for July, August, September. So if you want to take any of those at one courses, I will pay for it as long as you fill out the form by June 14th. I've got a link there and you can also find that on the page. And then I have some sources for you all. I've got the Penguin um, professor there, her link. If you want to check that out, the video, she has a lot of other really fun videos. So that's all I have for you today. But thank you all so much for being here and let me know. I'd love to hear if any of the tools that we talked about today work for you and how they work and um, any other ideas that come up. You know, a lot of who I am today and the teacher I am today is from what I've learned from others. So in our part two series, tell us about the next part. So um, when we were talking about this series, we thought it would be nice to sort of talk about the big ideas and let that percolate a little bit. And then for me to follow up with some of the practical how to. So how do you use some of the tools that Nicole has been talking about? So I'll be following up with um, applying some of these wonderful humanizing tips um, on May 27th. Yes, thank you, Senya. So I hope you all are there. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Yeah, we're going to put, post the recording on our on the Fly YouTube page. So hopefully if 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 you want to watch any of this again or if you are watching this for the first time on YouTube, thanks for staying till the end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole. This was thank so you. amazing. Really, really helpful. Thank you. I learned a lot. I did too. Oh, good, good.